Hi, my name is Sean O'Sullivan, and today we're going to take a tour of what I call the Beacon system, the Beacon and iBeacon ecosystem that has emerged over the last couple of years. First, to introduce myself, I'm a bit of a proximity nerd. Uh, we've been working in this area of short-range wireless and proximity for over 15 years. Back in the day, we helped create the original Java Bluetooth API standard called JSR82. And then we built our own implementation of that standard, which we licensed to handset manufacturers, phone makers worldwide. Um, and our implementation ultimately shipped on over 400 million phones. When the iPhone launched, it totally changed our business. Our product was tied to Java, which didn't run on the iPhone. So late in 2008, we decided to go back to the drawing board and create a proximity platform from scratch. One that would be neutral to programming languages and underlying wireless technology, and one that could take advantage of the power of the cloud. We call that local social, and you can find details on that at mylocalsocial.com. So what I'm gonna cover during this presentation is a few different things. First of all, I'm going to recap what we mean when we talk about proximity, and then we look at the role that Bluetooth, and specifically Bluetooth Low Energy plays in that. We'll take a look at what the big guys Apple and Google are doing in the proximity arena, and we look at a few use cases for how the technology is being used today. We will then zoom out to look at the wider context of the companies playing in this space. And lastly, we look at a few issues, uh, some trends in the area, and resources where you can find more information. So let's get started. So by proximity, we mean anything that might tell us or give us a signal that someone, and in particular a device they are carrying, is near to something else of interest. That's the basic idea. And there are a bunch of different technologies that we can use to do that. Let's leaving aside uh, GPS for now, which everyone knows can be used to locate us somewhere on the planet. There are actually a bunch of other technologies that can be used primarily for proximity purposes. And these include Wi-Fi, NFC, or even a QR code. When a device like a smartphone sees any of these, we know that the device is near to them. We know, for example, that with Wi-Fi, you're probably within about 50 to 60 feet of a Wi-Fi access point. Or uh, with NFC, that you just had to hold your phone very close to an NFC tag for it to activate, and so on. So if we know something about where our Wi-Fi access points are, or where we put a whole set of NFC tags, we can then extract interesting signals. We can figure out that, for example, someone is in a particular store or has just crossed the entrance to that store, um, has scanned a particular product on their phone, or spent a certain amount of time in a particular area, so in front of a particular painting or a car. We can then use these signals to actually do something, uh, make something happen, so we could trigger an offer or an unlock code for some reward or some loyalty points or just record the fact that the person was there with their permission of course if we do this in a planned fashion for example around stores that we own or museums that we manage we can get great data and turn that data into insight such as who's come to the store today which area of our museum is most popular and so on and this data is potentially very useful. And this is really why proximity can be a big deal. Okay, so if that's the high level context around proximity, we're now gonna zoom in on Bluetooth, specifically what's called Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth Smart, which underpins iBeacon and Google's use of proximity. So let's dive into that. So a few years back, a brand new version of Bluetooth was introduced by the Bluetooth SIG, which is the body that controls the Bluetooth standard. Uh, this new version was called Bluetooth Low Energy and was really a new wireless protocol designed from the ground up to handle certain kinds of use cases that traditional or classic Bluetooth struggled with. So for example, it was designed to be incredibly efficient in terms of power usage, meaning that it could be integrated into things that had a limited power source themselves, things like wearables or watches or heart rate monitors, um, and all kinds of things that could struggle with the power needs of classic Bluetooth. It was also designed to be incredibly fast, 
so that a device using BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, could send a small payload of data to another device listening for that data really quickly and get back to whatever it was doing. And this efficiency, this ability to do emit a payload really quickly and get back to whatever you were doing is kind of important for all kinds of devices. So this was the big picture for BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. Lots of devices could use BLE to efficiently send small payloads of data to something else nearby. So this picture tries to capture that. Typically, the something else will be a smartphone. So the stuff on the left here, a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, whatever. The stuff on the right are the resource-constrained wearables that might like to use BLE as a way to efficiently talk to things nearby. Um, the SIG itself used the term Bluetooth Smart for any device that wished to primarily be a sensor or something that would record some data and send it, and then Smart Ready for anything, uh, I call them an anchor device, that may be on the receiving end of that data and, and want to use it in some fashion. And uh, it's possible for devices to be both Smart Ready and Bluetooth Smart. So your heart rate monitor would typically be Bluetooth Smart branded, and your tablet might be Smart Ready. So, there are a lot of use cases for various scenarios for using Bluetooth Low Energy. <clears throat> One of them envisaged in the standard was a very simple use case, proximity. So, in this particular specific use case for BLE, the device on the right-hand side is primarily used as a marker or a beacon that can be detected. Same, as, same idea as being a lighthouse. So it's constantly emitting or advertising some information about itself. And in that information, there's some unique ID that might allow a receiver to uniquely identify it. So the, your phone on the left-hand side could see such a proximity beacon and then react in various ways depending on what that beacon represented. Each beacon can advertise some unique information, and that's in the payload of the message. And in this way, a beacon itself can be kept very simple, and the smarts or the intelligence about what to do with what the beacon represents typically lives either on the mobile side or back into the cloud or those two operating in concert. So your classic example is, uh, in a shop, for example, we could put some beacons at a certain point in the shop. So here they're on the left-hand side, somewhere near a shelf. Um, and then an app running on my phone could detect such a beacon, figure out, using the information that that beacon sends, that it represents the cosmetic area or a given brand within the cosmetic area, and then take some action, for example, by triggering an offer for the user. Okay. So now we know where Bluetooth fits, fits with proximity. Now let's take a look at how the giants in mobile, Apple and Google, are using it. We'll start with Apple, as they were really the first to put support for proximity into their product line in a serious way and at scale. As it happens, <coughs> Wi-Fi has actually been used for a long time on mobile, both by Apple and Google and others, to help locate you. If you have never wondered why the faint gray writing under the off switch for your Wi-Fi says, location will be better with this on. Well, here's why. Just as we discussed previously, Wi-Fi can be used as a proximity signal to figure out if you're near to some specific access point. And if you're in a position to collect a large database of information about Wi-Fi access points, and you know roughly where they are and what their unique IDs are, then when a phone sees one, you can use it to help figure out where someone is. Since iOS 7, Bluetooth on the right-hand side here also got its own faint writing, which also says that location accuracy and nearby services are improved when Bluetooth is on. This was one of the little clues to Apple really promoting support for proximity and BLE in general within its mobile uh, operating system, iOS. So here's what happened. Back in uh, the Worldwide Developer Conference in June 2013, Apple mentioned on one of their slides that something called iBeacon was on the way. Details were hard to come by initially, but later that year, full details emerged of an, of a, of an Apple program and offering called iBeacon. So what is iBeacon? Well, from a technical perspective, iBeacon is partly a layer on top of standard Bluetooth low energy. Basically, 
Apple states that if a certain BLE device advertises information in a particular way and obeys certain rules, it can be called an iBeacon, an Apple Proximity Beacon. So the Apple rules govern things like how often the beacon emits some information, some advertising information, the content of the message and the, the formatting that it sends, and certain controls around um, how you can update that beacon. Um, Apple uh, did several things when it launched iBeacon. Um, uh, it enabled third parties, third party hardware manufacturers to adopt the iBeacon standard and create hardware beacons that complied to the Apple convention. And there's a great list uh, of these reviewed by Isle Labs, which they call the Hitchhiker's Guide to iBeacon Hardware. Uh, today, 2015, there are at least 50, maybe more, manufacturers of uh, iBeacons around the world. So now they're plentiful and in supply and price is uh, pretty competitive. Hardware, of course, is only part of the story. Apple did a whole set of things to really uh, prime an ecosystem to emerge around iBeacon. So they did a, several things. They provided new APIs for developers so that a developer in their app could manage and use iBeacons easily. They actually did some work on iOS itself so that their operating system could efficiently look for beacons in the background and if it saw a beacon that it, know, it knows that an app is interested in that's been installed on the phone, it could generate an alert or a notification up to that app or to the user. And they call that background notifications. They also ate their own dog food. So they installed beacons in their own Apple stores and began using them in tandem with their Apple store application and so on. Um, and from, I guess, the end of 2013 and coming into 2014, Apple really kind of galvanized the whole area uh, around iBeacon. So, so what? Well, um, as people began to get their heads around iBeacon, one of the first kind of waves of media interest particularly focused on retail, on the retail and shopping side of the world. So as we came into 2014, there were a lot of articles and coverage about how Apple and iBeacon was about to revolutionize the retail industry. So we're going to take a little look at, at, at why that was and, and what was behind some of that coverage. And the way we'll do that is, let's look at a couple of things, uh, we call them proximity mechanics. So things you can do if proximity is easy for you to implement and deploy in your applications and services. So the first thing is, uh, if you're using beacons, um, it, it gets much easier to do things like triggering a greeting or a notification on entry to a store or or entry to a particular area within a store, or even uh, after somebody has left a particular area. And this can be a big deal for certain kinds of retailers. So for example, in grocery uh, retail, quite a few of the grocery guys have apps, but they have notoriously uh, low install rates. So if you're able to remind somebody uh, as they enter your store that you they have your app and it would be a good idea to open it, because all sorts of goodies lie within, then the open rates go way up. The second proximity mechanic is around um, offers. So it becomes possible to create offers and promotions that only unlock in a particular area, uh, if you're in the store or even within a specific area in the store. So you could have offers visible within an app that can act as a footfall driver. They're visible in the app, but actually you can't unlock them and get the value unless you come into the store or come into a particular area of the store. So in this way, they can act as a footfall driver. Next up, uh, points and rewards. So Shopkick was probably the poster child and the lead innovator of doing this particular mechanic using proximity in the US. Uh, many of you will know Shopkick. 
who um, campaigned initially on the basis that you could earn points just for walking into a store. So they were attaching loyalty points to presence as opposed to purchase, to your presence in the store as opposed to you having to buy anything. So you walk into the store, you open the Shopkick app, and boom, you're awarded some points. And those points have real value. So proximity is great for doing that. Um, again, can act as a footfall driver and also acts as a great point uh, for beginning a conversation with a shopper at the start of their shopping journey as opposed to perhaps at the end uh, when they're at the till, when it's too late to advise them, inform them and influence them. And lastly, we can use beacons as context. Um, so, uh, because we can place beacons around a store, we can get a good feel for what area of the store you're in, down to quite a bit of resolution. And on mobile, this means we can do things like rearrange the content of an app so that the content that surfaces is based on where you are. And that really, for the user, it appears as a convenience item. Cool, this app rearranges itself best based on where I am. And what that does is save uh, the user having to hunt and peck for information down through a blizzard of menu options. And instead, the app magically pulls the information that it thinks is most relevant to where the user is standing right now to the front and center. And that saves clicks and drill downs on mobile. And anything that removes friction like that really enhances the user experience. One way of thinking about what beacons can do on retail and, and elsewhere is act as a bridge between the physical world and the digital world. Beacons you can think of as being markers that help us mark out real world spaces with digital IDs so that a mobile application can behave more smart, be more smart when it enters those spaces. And in retail, um, where we often meet e-commerce people who are used to really thinking hard about all the data uh, on their websites. You know, who, come, who came to the site today? How long did they stay? What journey did they take on the website? When did they drop off? What, how many times have they visited in the last few weeks, etc.? Well, e-commerce folks are very familiar with living and breathing that kind of information. Beacons can help surface the same kind of data but for real world locations. So it's ultimately all about the data, which can be crunched to produce insights about visitor customer behavior in stores, museums, concerts, conferences, offices, streets, or even cities. So I'm now gonna take a look at a few use cases from the last 18 months or so in no particular order. And these are kind of wider than retail, related to retail in some cases, but just to give us a feel for what else are beacons being used for and where have they turned up. So the first is in the area of sports. We've seen quite a few deployments of iBeacons in sports ground and stadia. Major League Baseball was one of the first, but we've seen most sports by now, basketball, American football, baseball, ice hockey, in Europe, uh, soccer and rugby, all using beacons in a number of ways to engage with and assist fans at a game. Things like uh, navigation within the stadium, wayfinding, uh, ordering from your seat, uh, direction to the nearest concession stands, and so on. Uh, in addition, we've also seen uh, premium content, so uh, access in an app to premium content that you can only access uh, if you're in the stadium or in a particular zone within the stadium. And this is all, of course, part of making the at-the-game experience compelling. You know, as uh, TV and TV coverage gets HD and then 4K and Super HD and more and more compelling with multiple camera angles, um, the real world stadia need to give people more reasons to get off their couch and uh, turn up and support their, their team. Next up is travel. Uh, airlines, airports and travel in general has been a huge area and we think it's one of the, the hot areas that holds a lot of potential 
uh, in the context of proximity and beacons. Already, quite a few of the world's leading airlines and airports have deployed beacons to do a few different things. For example, um, triggering notifications and reminders at different parts of the customer journey, such as uh, alerting customers or reminding them what sort of documents they need as they approach check-in, or using a deep link uh, in their app to their electronic boarding card so that they don't have to hunt and peck for that boarding card and waste time with other people waiting behind them to, to pull it out to service. In the airline industry, uh, they have had an initiative with CITA, S-I-T-A, to create a common use beacon registry uh, to coordinate uh, the approach and deployment to beacons in airports in particular, so that passengers get a great experience and are not overwhelmed with a blizzard of notifications and mobile spam as they uh, as they move through the environment. Sephora, there's a pretty good use case online for Sephora. Um, they just did nice, relatively constrained and simple use of beacons in some of their stores where they would trigger uh, reminders about things that are available to some of their loyalty points. Um, customers uh, in store so th they noticed that for example even their regular customers and their loyalty point customers might forget that they are entitled for example to things like a free makeover on a particular visit and they used the beacons as a way to get onto their screen to just give them a gentle reminder that this might be available to them here's a here's a very interesting use case with halo um, and one of the reasons it's interesting is it uses one of the features that uh, is often overlooked on iBeacon in particular, and that's the ability for any iOS device to be a beacon. So Halo has taken advantage of this with a particular feature called Pay with Halo. Um, and it works like this. Uh, it's a very particular use case. If you don't hail your cab, through the Halo system, but instead you turn up at a rank and get into a cab, or you just flag one down at the side of the road, and you get into um, you get into the taxi, you get into the cab. Now, if both the driver is in the Halo network and me, the customer, is in the Halo network, well, I may get a notification saying that I could pay for this journey with Halo, even though I didn't actually book the journey through the Halo network. And what's actually happening here is my Halo app has detected a Halo registered iBeacon, which is the driver's phone acting as an iBeacon, and then has alerted me that, hey, you can pay for this ride um, uh, with the Halo. So it's quite an interesting uh, use case of the your phone being a beacon. In the world of museums and tourism in general, tourist attractions and tourism in, in all its forms, uh, beacons are likely to, to see a lot of success. We've seen a lot of early adoption of iBeacon in museums, uh, in galleries, and other visitor experiences. So uh, the obvious idea is that the visitors can use an app that knows where they are, it may know at different levels of granularity depending on what you want. So for example, it may just know you're in a room of modernist paintings, um, but it may also be able to detect that you've stood in front of this painting for some time and magically surface some information about the artist and other works and other, inf other media that you could tap into. So uh, we've also seen a few companies appear who uh, are targeting the sector explicitly with a vertical solution that's that's beacon centric. Apple's, Apple themselves have uh, used beacons in their stores. We mentioned that before. Uh, they kind of focused on initially, at least, on a self-service aspect to how the beacons are used. Um, We've seen uh, PayPal launch its own beacon, um, but one of the use cases that we kind of like uh, around uh, deploying beacons that we've seen Tesco trial in the UK is beacons being used to just add a little bit of digital magic on the click and collect experience. So in this particular case, the idea is that a Tesco customer 
has uh, ordered online or on mobile for some goods that they're going to collect in store and if they have the app as they cross the threshold of the store they get a little notification that says your order is ready here's the order number here's where to go and at the same time a member of staff at the click and collect counter gets an alert saying that Sean is on his way and have order number 456 ready. So just a nice use of the technology, not too intrusive, very contextually sensitive and nicely done. The, um, the last two areas I'm going to touch on here are around high value items, uh, cars and uh, property. We've seen uh, beacons used in automotive sales and real estate sales. Um, in the case of cars, the, 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 the high level pitch is pretty simple. Put a beacon in every car and uh, let the car tell you about itself. So as a user wanders the showroom or a wider lot, uh, indoor or outdoors with many cars in it, they can pause in front of each car and an app can automatically let them deep dive into information about the car so beats having to stare at a whole bunch of crammed information onto a little sheet stuck to the window um, so uh, in the case of uh, real estate and this is one of the deployments we had ourselves with sables um, same thing a house can be beaconized beacons in every room and now as someone wanders through the house the app can auto magically present information uh, based on knowing where they are in the house and they can see construction details about the house perhaps insulation and standards details or details about the appliances or the interior design etc and we mixed a bunch of media uh, photos video and other kind of details for people that they could pick up as they went through and the key of course in both these cases uh, is that there was great data resulting so on the automotive car sales guys um, the sales manager or the salesperson could see that you know sh such and such a customer is always stopping in front of Dodge Chargers. So I think perhaps maybe they're interested in a Dodge Charger and it's their fifth time back this month. So maybe they're getting serious about buying. In the case of uh, real estate, the number one buying signal is the amount of time that people spent in the house. So what they were most interested in was a sorted list of the dwell time for visitors to show houses. So the reason for kind of taking a quick tour of all of those is just to remind everyone, despite the initial coverage around uh, iBeacon, very much focusing on offers and push and notifications, uh, there's, it's really about the data and it's really about creating a magical experience if you can by using these things very wisely um, for in particular context okay so that's the apple story and they had the game to themselves for quite a while as google was slow into this area for a few reasons but let's take a look at what alphabet sorry google has been doing in terms of catching up so I mentioned that Apple introduced iBeacon in 2013 at their Worldwide Developer Conference. Well, it was actually September 2014 that Google first introduced a project which they called Physical Web. And initially, uh, Physical Web was very googly. It was just a little project sitting on the internet. It wasn't a product. It was very much under the radar. And as you can see, I highlighted a few phrases from their initial website because it seemed to be that it was as much what it wasn't about it was as what it was about. Um, it seemed to me that their philosophy from the Google side was quite rooted in the world of Internet of Things. And part of their central tenet was that you probably weren't going to have an app for every single connected device, you know, even in your house. So over the next two years, it's realistic that lots of people might have 20, 30, 50 connected devices in their houses. And you're probably not going to really want uh, an app for every single connected device there. But still, you'd like a way that proximity could be used to react and engage with these devices in a user-friendly way. And it seemed to me that part of the initial philosophy with physical web was about addressing that so at least when 
physical web was launched, this is how we contrasted iBeacon versus physical web. Beacon was a product from Apple. Physical web initially was a project. It was open source. You could go and get hardware. The spec was open. In the case of Google, you could just go and make some. Uh, the payload uh, emitted by the beacon was different in the case of physical web. Uh, it was playing to Google's strengths. It was a URL. So really, it was a. Uh, it, it, it tried to extend the web. Uh, terminology out to f physical things and uh, they also at least initially weren't really overly exercised by background notifications uh, it was very much kind of a foreground activity from a behavior point of view a user would need to take out something like take the phone out of their pocket but have an app front and center for it to do something and that was the original idea. And so part of the, the spec from Google was that there would be something called a URI beacon. And this URI beacon would emit uh, a URL that could be read. So the idea for the way it worked here, and I've kind of labeled these uh, in order one to four, um, was that the the beacon advertises a URL, so that's a beacon down there in the bottom left. Uh, it advertises a URL. Something can can detect those uh, beacon advertisements. Um, initially, they provided an app for both Android and iOS that could let you play around with these and see uh, uh, see beacons nearby that were URI beacons and see their URLs. A user can then tap on that URL and that could do whatever the web could normally do. It could bring you to a web page or it could perhaps deep link into something, an app on your mobile device that might give you some control over the device where the beacon is living uh, or perhaps download some interactive web content which again could do the same thing. But that was the, this was kind of the flow that was anticipated. So here's one way to kind of summarize uh, Google and proximity. 2013 and, and 14, from my, from my perspective, they rolled out support for Bluetooth Low Energy in their hardware and in their compatible hardware manufacturers, and they provided some core APIs to deal with Bluetooth Low Energy, and and that was kind of it. Um, then they launched Physical Web, which was positioned as a project, didn't have a whole lot of an ecosystem around it, but but got a lot of people interested and beacons, physical hardware beacons that supported physical web did begin to appear pretty quickly. And then uh, there was kind of a major uh, update in July of this year, Google launched Eddystone. And this was a proper evolution in their approach to proximity uh, with more support across a number of Google products and more comprehensive thinking in evidence of a whole solution and ecosystem. So this Edison stuff is a pretty major evolution to Google's approach, approach to proximity. Um, it's designed to be extensible. It's designed to work well on iOS and Android. And the core of it is really focused on the message format sent by a beacon. They have this notion of a frame type, and each frame type is used to govern a kind of use case for the message. And there are three main types, URL, UID, and TLM we'll mention each really briefly. So uh, the URL, if you like, was their, was their original URI beacon format idea that the beacon is sending a URL that you can decide to do what you want. So this kind of integrates what URI beacon used to do. Um, next up frame type is UID. Um, and this is a, uh, one way of thinking about this, it's 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 like the way iBeacon works. iBeacon has a major code and a minor minor code um, alongside a UUID that gets transmitted. In the case of UID, you have a namespace ID and an instant ID. So you might group um, your your beacons so that they have their own unique instance IDs, and then they share namespaces for particular brands or shops or whatever it is, depending on what you're deploying. And this is handy for filtering, and they give some uh, filtering options in the API to take advantage of these. And the third uh, frame type, at least at launch time, is the telemetry frame. Really interesting. This it's it's uh, it's an example of some good 
solid thinking on the Google side, having looked at the initial deployments that happened uh, in the world of beacons. And so with iBeacon, a bunch of the manufacturers were doing kind of, they had to do kind of clever clog, work around things to get information off the beacon to an app like, for example, Battery Life. Um, uh, so they had to do kind of little sneaky, clever workarounds to make that happen. Um, using a telemetry frame and, and building it out this way from Google is a smart way to, to promote that to being a, a proper first class use case that people might like to do. There's lots of things that we may need to do uh, and that can be useful to us in terms of getting information about the beacon off the beacon, battery being one example, but temperature, um, uh, some beacons, like beacons from Sensoro, have light sensors on board. Um, the activity the beacons through been through in terms of traffic and uptime and stuff like that. Uh, light, for example, could be used, um, could be interesting um, to tell a beacon when to sleep uh, or to monitor across your beacon's uh, other behavior around your physical spaces. In addition to all of that, so that's the that's the Eddystone uh, core specification, the protocol itself. Google have now also introduced a proximity beacon API. Um, so this is a cloud-based store where you can register beacons and a bunch of associated de uh, data. And they've wired in some other Google APIs, uh, the nearby API and the places API, so that beacons detected can be a signal input to these services. So some significant um, improvement in addressing proximity as a first class kind of use case from Google and the real emergence now of a, a real ecosystem uh, from from Google. So they're, they're now, we, we can regard this I think as being properly positioned as an alternative to Apple's iBeacon both in terms of hardware support, but also in terms of kind of first class support within uh, Android and also in other Google ecosystems. And a bunch of the uh, key manufacturers uh, um, have um, of hardware have already uh, jumped on board. In fact, at lunchtime, I think a number of the main manufacturers were in the list of those who were shipping day one beacons that would support the Eddystone format. Okay, so uh, a quick pause for Brett and a brief recap. So let's just recap. Beacon technology, primarily based on Bluetooth low energy, whose low power efficiency and wide support in devices makes it great for proximity applications and services. Both Apple and Google have their own offerings based on Bluetooth Low Energy, but with their own conventions and formats uh, on top, controlling things like message format, frequencies, and connectivity options. And while a lot of the initial focus was around retail, we've seen Beacon deployed in real estate, tourism, travel, entertainment, conferencing, and much, much more. So what we're now going to do next is take a quick tour uh, of the explosion in companies uh, in the Beco system. So let's do that. First, as, as, as a way into this, um, no one's really sure how many beacons are deployed right now. My best guess is around two to three million beacons deployed worldwide. That's an educated guess based on the size of known deployments plus conversations with manufacturers, partners, solution providers around the world. But the, the key message about this slide is that it's early days um, in the deployment of these things. And depending on who you listen to and who you believe, people are forecasting, analysts are forecasting anywhere from 60 million to 300 million beacons deployed worldwide by 2018. Personally, I'm on the upper end or even beyond that on that. I'm quite upbeat on the volume um, that we'll see deployed. But I do think that the volume will be deployed in a slightly different format to what we're seeing today in terms of standalone beacons, which we'll come back to later on. So we've seen a blizzard of companies arrive into this scene from all around the world. And you have 
pure play hardware companies. There are marketing automation companies that uh, using beacons for indoor play space signals. There's companies very focused on shopper marketing who, who have adopted <coughs> proximity and beacon technology into what they're doing and so on. And of course, kind of lording it up above all of us is Apple and Google. So um, there's a few ways of trying to, for our own uh, benefit, we're trying to group these uh, companies into uh, particular boxes. And here, here's our first attempt at doing that. And down the bottom left, we have the hardware guys. Um, bottom right, those who are very focused on indoor location in particular. Um, and then a big blob in the middle, which is too complicated right now, we've lumped together several different kinds of companies into a, into a big mush in the center, where the guys near the bottom are kind of of that, of that central box are kind of more proximity platform vendors. Um, top right has more shopper marketing platform guys, and top left of the middle has more mobile marketing uh, companies. But you know, it's not hard and fast. Uh, some of these companies belong in, in all these boxes. So we are continually updating this and uh, revising it to try and make it better. Um, and include and squeeze everybody in who's turned up in this area. Um, so we also try and track just the activity, <coughs> um, funding activity in particular, or any M&A activity we see uh, of the companies in this area as we um, as we as we detect it and record it. So we'll continue to do that uh, over the next while. Okay, so to finish up couple of hurdles um, and in no particular order on these. Uh, Android, e even back a year ago, used to be a bit of a head scratcher and a pain if you were thinking about deployment and trying to get a consistency of experience. That's less so now. Uh, this this um, update from Google with Eddystone has been great. And depending on what it is you're trying to do, now deploying a solution that uses proximity across Android and iOS is becoming much more consistent and much more tractable to do. The second thing here, uh, you know, this whole iBeacon stuff got way overhyped, as lots of new technologies do at the start, and created most definitely a, a bit of an expectation issue around uh, what was possible. Uh, now we're entering a more sober, interesting, sustainable period uh, after initial trials have been underway for a lot of the big guys, and now we're into kind of reasonably large-scale deployments and all of the, the fun that goes with them. So that kind of high period, I think, is tailing off. Uh, item three and four here are kind of related. Um, uh, you know, notifications on I, iOS with iBeacon created a lot of interest on, on generating notifications all the time. And we've been surprised by lots of uh, quite large potential customers that we've dealt with who are very exercised by this one particular feature, this ability to generate notifications, but haven't really thought through the consequences of doing that uh, all the time, or uh, if you like, doing it when a customer doesn't expect or want it. So um, we, we, try and, we try and encourage uh, a deep thinking through what the experience is going to be like on mobile, and we end up often saying just because you can doesn't mean you should with a particular feature. And, and this, the thing we said about most is 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 all about notifications. Um, and it's kind of related to this next item where uh, there is a there is most definitely a concern around privacy and tracking um, that people have depending on the context of where beacons can be used. And it, it sits in the wider um, concern around the NSA and these highly secure black phones that have emerged over the last while and stuff like that. So our observation on that is that those with the uh, those with the best privacy policies will will be competitive 
in this area in terms of deploying solutions because they're going to need that. And the last item is around scaling and kind of, let's call it the, um, you know, after the initial solutions that came out, which were pretty rudimentary, uh, we rushed out to market to let us try and get our hands on this stuff and use it. Now, now we're really working through all the boring stuff you need for big deployments, for scale deployments. You know, all the kind of uh, block and tackle work that needs to be done for managing large groups of beacons and controlling access to everything properly and so on. And that's a good sign. It's a sign of maturity uh, around the whole area. One other thing, um, one of the reasons I mentioned that I was kind of bullish on volume with beacons looking ahead, uh, you know, a lot of what the the market has seen to date has been this kind of standalone beacons. Beacons you you buy as individual little little devices and stick to things, uh, and that's been great for the build out that we've seen so far and the kind of trials we've seen so far. But really, the, I believe the future is very much about the embedded market. So beacons are, are, as we speak, getting built into all kinds of stuff, light bulbs, switches, radiators, household appliances, wearables, and on and on and on. And that's great because you know, a couple of years out uh, from where we are today, I think we'll see beacons as a, uh, being treated as standard in a lot of our built infrastructure. What we do with them, will very wildly and will be up to whoever owns the space, but they'll be built in as a matter of course. Same as lights are and other kind of stuff that we expect to be in a modern office or mall or any other physical space. So that's one of the reasons that I'm kind of bullish on volume. I think as these things start to come through the market, well, the volume goes way, way, way up. Okay. So uh, lastly, to finish up, a couple of resources. Uh, obviously, we have uh, some resources ourselves. We put presentations like this online. We've done a couple of series for O'Reilly, both uh, webcasts and their blog series. Um, we have a platform you can play with. We do consulting and training and so on. So and we blog regularly on everything we find about iBeacon if we think it's interesting. Um, our friends in Unicast, uh, have been behind an initiative called Proxbook. So Proxbook is a directory of all the proximity players worldwide. So it's great. Basically, you can go to Proxbook and you can slice and dice all of those logos that are on my big ecosystem picture in different ways, depending on what it is you're looking for. We have in our slides a set of the uh, all the links uh, related to Google and Proximity collected together. And a um, couple of places to go. Don Dodge uh, from Google is great on this whole area. Street Fight is really good for uh, coverage at the hyper local level on everything to do with advertising, small businesses trying to use technology, hyper local publishing, indoor, etc. Um, and uh, if you look up Beacon, there is a uh, great blog there. He blogs on Twitter. He is Doosan Writer um, and uh, some great stuff on all things I become and so on. We leave these in uh, all our slides here. And with that, I will uh, take an opportunity to say thanks if you've been listening. And uh, if there's anything we can help with, please get in touch. Bye.